Hi there. I'm Don Samuelai, President, U.S. Operations of Editage, an English language services provider, and I'm here today at Walters Kluwer in Philadelphia talking with Dr. Ann Woods, who is Chief Nurse, and Sean Kennedy, the Editor-in-Chief of American Journal of Nursing. Hi there. Hi. So, uh, we've done a series of little videos um, talking about different aspects of publishing in, in Walters Kluwer and the AGN, the journal. Um, and so I thought it would be good to start exploring ethics of publication and good publication practices versus things that authors should not be doing, either in interacting with the journal or in the writing of the paper from scratch. And so perhaps we can start with Sean mm -hmm. and, uh, and maybe you can talk first about some of the strange things that you do see and the, <laughs> and the red flags that you sure. see come across your desk and we can expand upon that. Sure. Well, one thing um, that I think some authors are maybe confused about is that you can query an, any number of journals about submission of a paper. But once you submit a paper, you can only submit to one journal. And some authors don't do that. And we've uh, come across authors. Uh, I've, I've been at a meeting with an editor and said, oh, I saw your journal. And, and we look and I said, gee, I have that same paper. And so we've come to that point, but I think for most authors, um, if they know that and they submit, um, some of the things that they need to be careful of is, again, as um, making sure that they sending it to the right journal, the right email to the right journal. Editors don't like to see that people are, you know, shopping their manuscript around or, um, and we can tell that sometimes because they haven't changed the format in according to author guidelines that they've submitted elsewhere and probably got rejected so now they're submitting to us which doesn't matter because it's not a good fit for other journals and maybe a perfect fit for us but it kind of makes you have a little bit more of a antenna go up to say okay well what's what's wrong that it got rejected elsewhere, is there something in the content? So we look a little bit more carefully. So, so multiple submissions to multiple journals, journals is a no-no. No. Yeah, no. and that's that's when you do that, because when you do that, you tend to not get onto the submission list again, because well, as an editor, when I get that, that paper, I review it. I send it out to peer reviewers, so they're spending time reviewing it. It comes back in, we discuss it, and then send out the revision letter, which takes about an hour just once we make the decision uh, about the status of the manuscript. So it's a lot of time and, and uh, hours spent by people who are very busy. And then to find out, oh, well, I submitted it elsewhere. That's, you become a persona non grata. So many query letters is fine, submit once. Um, the other issue that I think authors need to be aware of uh, is plagiarism. And I think people are aware of it nowadays uh, because there are many sites uh, that people can submit to. And I think at this point in university students know that their papers get submitted through either Turnitin or uh, we use Authenticate and it comes back. And so we can find if people are plagiarizing. Also peer reviewers who really know the content, they can tell you where that paragraph came from, what what other Absolutely. textbook came from. And so, so for, for the author, just to be aware, as an industry, we have services like Crossref where all the major publishers have, for lack of a better term, dumped their collections into a common database. And Authenticate as a software interface screens all the known published works that are out there across right. all publishers. And so when you as a journal screen a paper, you're not just screening it against your own body of work, you're screening it against the literature that goes back to the 50s. Right, and, and anything that's out on the net. Mm -hmm. So right. it, we, we, see, we see it all. <laughs> yeah, and so authors beware that you cannot yes. be plagiarizing material from other right. papers, and, and the, it, it is fine, obviously, to make reference to other works, but that reference needs to be cited appropriately and described appropriately Correct. as the other person's work. And even your own previous work. Uh, and I know it's difficult. Many authors say, well, I said it in the best way I, I could say it in the first the first time I wrote about it. And so now I'm writing about it for you, so I have to use the same language. And it's like, no, you don't. Um, or if there's only one way, and, and frequently we come across this in the method section. And, and that can be dealt with by just, you know, we pull it out in a box and we get permission from as cited in or um, you know uh, adapted from or used with permission from the original 
but readers have a right to know whether this has been out there or if they've read it, if they're purchasing, whether it's a journal or a book, that they're purchasing original content. And then, of course, there are copyright laws as well. So there's plagiarism, blatant plagiarism, which is stealing the work of others, and then self-plagiarism, which is using your own work, but it's already been published. So those are the two areas that I think authors need to be two areas that, that are problematic. And you touched on and split them appropriately because there really are two issues at hand. One is intellectual property mm -hmm. of the original authors and the other is copyright, which is either owned by the original author or owned by the journal or publisher mm -hmm. of that paper. And so by plagiarizing something, not giving adequate reference, you are actually creating uh, two no-nos. One is steal theft of intellectual property and theft of copyright. Mm -hmm. yeah. Correct. The other, the other issue that we that we see, um, or that I would say, um, authors, some authors aren't aware of, is that there are standards for being authors. Um, we follow, as most journals do, or many journals do, the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors standards for authorship, and um, and those are can be found easily icmje.org, um, and. What they require, and I won't detail all the, the criteria, but basically it requires that you have to be involved in the design and, and uh, intellectual development of the content, have uh, been participating in drafting the original manuscript or in intimately involved in revising it uh, uh, significantly, that you give approval uh, for the manuscript, and that you're, you can take public responsibility. So that's what it means to be an author. So someone who, what we see many times is people will um, uh, have an author on there who really didn't do anything but kind of was a, a cheerleader or just read it and said, yeah, this is good or you might change that. That's not an author. Those are people who can be acknowledged. So um, this this practice of honorary or guest authors, as they call is is very uh, frequent, I think, in academic uh, areas where uh, the tradition has been to put the faculty chair of the department on, or in uh, hospital settings, it may be that you put the um, the manager or the supervisor or director of the unit where you did your research, but that's not considered authorship. So I think um, that's becoming more important in, uh, in all areas now. Um, there's been some studies done showing how that impacts um, that impacts bias, it impacts uh, data, the appropriate data collection, uh, and it impacts really how, how the public can um, accept that this is a, a bona fide vetted piece of, of, of work that stands up to scientific rigor. So um, honorary authors is, the, is one part which is basically having somebody on there who isn't an author. The other aspect that we see, um, less so now because again people are becoming aware of it, is ghost authorship where you have somebody who actually is an author but isn't named as such. And that's where the bias is really comes in because people maybe have been paid to write a certain article and that person may have been paid by someone who has a vested interest in a certain viewpoint. So these type of issues I think are becoming more in the forefront. They haven't been an issue for nursing, or I shouldn't say they haven't been an issue, they haven't been recognized in nursing, uh, because, but now that nursing is doing more scholarly work and research uh, and bench research uh, and focusing on clinical outcomes, that's becoming more important. So those are some of the big issues that we, we see and, and are trying to communicate to authors. When, when are they, I just throw in another that just came to mind, and that's conflict of interest and declaration of mm -hmm. conflict of interest. And people... Um, always perceive conflict of interest. Oh, conflict, it's something that I, I'm i not doing appropriately. And that's not what conflict of interest is about. Conflict of interest is about disclosure of conflicting interests or disclosure mm -hmm. of competing interests mm -hmm. and is not something to be looked at negatively, but something to be looked at in the form of transparency. I Correct. have this relationship with a pharmaceutical company or I have been doing this or this or I have um, this paper may be part of a larger study. Uh, Correct. These are types of disclosures that actually allow the journal to understand where this paper is coming from and who the authors truly are in this paper. Um, perhaps Correct. you can talk a little bit more about these um, these interests, the disclosure of these interests and the sure. need for it. Um, uh, it's important in, in terms of transparency because when a reader is is um, a digesting material and thinking about how they may use this in their practice, 
um, they need to be sure that the material is based on scientific evidence and not on particular biases that the author may have had. So that, uh, for example, if the author uh, has been paid by a company uh, to promote a certain product, whether it's a device or, or a drug, that this author is only looking at the positive studies. And we've seen this happen uh, years ago. JAMA had a, um, a, did a study. Uh, we also did a follow-up study. But this has happened repeatedly. I think it was the um, uh, ch children with the mm -hmm. antidepressants. Um, and it came out that not all the data was being presented because it wasn't favorable. Now, that's an extreme case, and most authors don't practice that way. But that brought out the fact that there needs to be transparency uh, in uh, Relationships. Uh, we we have at, at AJN have always asked, what was your what was your role in developing this manuscript? Do you have any ties? Who paid? Were you paid? And if so, who? Um, since Walters Kluwer now has a form that is a part of our manuscript submission process for all journals across all journals, and it follows these ICMJE guidelines that ask the author not only their criteria for being an author, but also um, uh, disclosing transparency, not only in terms of payment, but um, are you employed by an institute? I mean, it's pretty rigorous. And also even asked about stock options and things like right. that, which I have no idea how people find out that some of that information. But um, the, it's important because the reader needs to know that this is, this is true and accurate and evidence-based and not biased, as I right. said. So that's a big issue. Um, I just want to add one thing here. So Walters Kluwer, as a publishing entity, we have a very large arm of our business that's related to continuing education, continuing medical education. And any article that is chosen to have CE or CME credit, a disclosure has to be made related to the conflict of interest, any financial disclosure, or we cannot accredit the article with the um, requisite credits that it would get. So it's so important for us as a business to make sure we have complete transparency of what the author is associated with before we go ahead and publish that journal. Mm -hmm. Now we realize many authors, I mean, who are experts, uh, we have a couple of uh, contributing editors and we realize that the experts in the field are often people who work with the, uh, closely on advisory councils for pharma industry for various things, and, and, and that we understand that. But again, that's the transparency, so that that's the right. reader understands there, there is a relationship there, and the reader can, knowing that, has access to the content. But we're very careful about making sure that transparency is there. The, um, the take-home message is that a conflict of interest is not anything bad. It, it is a disclosure Absolutely. of transparency. Right, right. Well, the other issue about conflict of interest, um, number one, we also ask of our peer reviewers before each time before they do a peer review, we ask them if they have any uh, conflicts of interest to disclose. But the other aspect that many people don't think about, I, uh, in my view, with conflict of interest is they think of it as only as financial. But there can be other conflicts of interest. For example, somebody is doing a similar similar work or similar researchers were in the middle of, of writing a similar paper mm -hmm. and they get this this paper to review so there's a there's a different conflict of interest or this may be a competitor for a same professorship or a position so there are different layers so it's not just financial and authors need to know that those type of things need to be brought out too like I worked with this person or this person was you know my boss or something like that and you, and you touched on uh, one piece that resonated with me as well um, and that is how um, duplicate or um, duplicate publication, or what we often refer to as salami slicing, where you're taking a piece of a study and publishing, and then a greater piece and a greater piece, and getting soaking three or four papers out of a, a one single set of data, and how this actually affects meta analysis mm -hmm. of literature. Uh, and so perhaps you can uh, discuss why salami slicing is actually bad for the literature and bad for uh, an author in, in how their papers are perceived? Uh, we just had one. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, so uh, as you, you explained salami, si salami slicing nicely, and I, I do want to say it's different from writing for a different audience. It's different from publishing research and then writing a clinical application piece that pr uh, for clinicians that provides clinical implications. So there are, there are different types of papers that one can write from a research 
study as opposed to just repeating, as you said, using the same data. Um, the, the problem it makes with the literature is that, for, for one thing, as you said, when p someone's don't going to do an analysis, it looks like there's a, a larger body of literature than there is on this. The other thing is that it's really kind of dishonest because it makes this author look like they have ten publications when in reality it really should be maybe one or two. So I think there's, there's, it's a little bit of a deceptive practice from the authorship trying to gain as much as they can. Um, and also it's, it does hurt the literature because it makes it appear that there are several uh, pieces of research on this one topic all showing these positive results or all showing similar results and that skews any further uh, meta-analysis or systematic views that are trying to build on that. So. I think that for myself who's done some research uh, around secondary um, systematic reviews, um, I think the most important thing is when we look at research that's submitted to a publication that the methodology is sound and it has a lot of rigor behind it and that if your methodology doesn't have the rigor or the soundness of science behind it, your article is not going to get accepted. It also brings into the question of the validity of data. You know, so many times we'll be looking at a study and we'll see that the numbers just don't quite up, add up. They, they forget to mention that some of the people who dropped out of the study, you have to talk about that and why those people dropped out. They don't adequately discuss their statistical analysis. Um, they don't talk about the limitations of the study. And all these things are really going to affect the credibility of the publication. So one of the things that we really look at at Walters Clore is to make sure that people who are publishing any type of research from a randomized control trial to an observational study, even to quality improvement studies or systematic review meta-analysis, that they follow the guidelines. And uh, the Equator Network website is a great place to go. And it is the standard by which we publish any type of research that is done and we really encourage all authors when they get started to write they go to that website they see exactly what has to be included in their article or their research so that they don't leave anything out if you mm -hmm. leave something out your article is not going to get published and it also speaks to then the um, the credibility and the soundness of the evidence that's published. You know, we want to drive outcome changes by the best available evidence. We want the best available evidence to inform practice changes. We can only do that if the science is sound. And so that part is really important and all authors before they write need to really think about that and especially before they submit their, their manuscript for consideration. Great. So with, with that I'll bring closure to this segment of our discussion. And again, I'll, I'll mention that I'm Don Samuelak, the President of U.S. Operations of Editage, and I'm here at Walters Clore in Philadelphia talking with Dr. Ann Woods, the Chief Nurse, and Sean Kennedy, Editor-in-Chief, the American Journal of Nursing. Thank you, and look for other videos in the series.